Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. I'm excited for this week. We're diving into advanced SQL injection. Now the two vectors that I'm going to be talking about this week, I have used personally in bug bounties and penetration tests. And those techniques are Boolean inference and blind SQL injection using sleep. The first thing we're going to need to do is make sure that our lab repo is up to date. So we're just going to run a git pull. Mine is up to date because I've been building it, but yours may take a second. And the next thing we're gonna to wanna to do is start the containers. So we'll move into Docker, SQLi site, and we're on Docker compose up minus D. Now that that's in, I just wanna do a quick recap. If you remember from the last video, the intro video, we did a union select to get our username and password from the users table. We can see the usernames and passwords here. But what happens if union is filtered? Well, we'll go to the nounion.php site. And we'll try the same attack. And we're seeing that we're getting filtered. And this is common, either web application firewalls or web developers are trying to do good and close off vulnerability holes. And that's good, that's what they should be doing but they may not be doing it correctly and they may be leaving some holes available. In order to progress from this point, we're going to have to understand a couple new pieces of SQL. If we move over here, we can jump into the container. And now that we're in the container, we can jump into the MySQL server. And the password for the web admin is admin underscore foobar. And now that we're in, I'm going to introduce you to two new concepts. And the first one is going to be substring. Now what substring does is it takes a string and gives you a chunk of that string that you define. So we can show you the most simple illustration of substring like this. We'll say select substring. And also you can just do substr. That's literally the same function. It's just an alias, but we'll do substring and we'll grab the string of SQL injection. And after the string, we're gonna say which character to start with and how many characters we want. So in this case, we're gonna start with the first character and we only want one character to return to us. And we see that the first character is S. Now, if we want the second character, we can do that, or we can grab a larger chunk. We can grab the first three characters or we can start at character five and take the next five characters. So that's what substring is for. This is going to be very helpful in our Boolean inference, but I've also used this in CTFs where maybe the web application only displays a certain number of characters. For instance, a certain field is meant to have a telephone number in it. So it's only returning 10 characters. Well, if we wanna dump a hash into that field, we can only dump it 10 characters at a time. And if you don't know how to use substring, you're never going to be able to get that full hash. So you can use substring in that way to dump part of a hash 10 characters at a time into the different fields. Now, the way we're going to use substring for our Boolean inference is we're actually going to do a nested select inside of the substring. That sounds a little weird. Let me show you. First things first is we're going to use the T web app database. And we're going to set up our same select substring again. But this time, instead of putting a string in here, we're going to set up a select statement. So we're going to get another parentheses and that's going to enclose our select statement. And we'll select username from users. And we're gonna to have to use our old friend, the limit statement, because we can't have it returning multiple rows. Substring is expecting one string. And if it's getting multiple rows, it doesn't necessarily know what string it's supposed to be giving you the subset of. So we'll use limit one and we close our parentheses. So that's where the string is coming from. And then we just want the first character and we want one character. And we see that the first user in users, the first character of that username is A. If we wanna check this out, we can look at the second character, which is B, third character is U and so on and so forth. We can continue this on and see that it's A Burton or Amos Burton. What if we want the second username or the third or the fourth? That's where the offset statement comes in. We can say, offset zero. 
And that's going to give us the first user. Actually, to show it easier, let's just select username from users and we'll say limit one offset zero. And we see a Burton offset one and that's Jay Holden offset two and Nagata, etc. So we can use offset in our substring statement to target the first username, the second username, the third username, etc. But where does that term Boolean inference come from? Where does that come in? Well, let's recreate the select statement that's happening inside of the web app. So the directory page, which is what we're attacking, has that select f name email from directory where f name equals and then that initial quote. Everything before that quote, including that quote, is what's given to us by the web application. Then we start typing our information. If you remember a couple videos ago, I described Boolean logic, the and in the or statements in SQL. We're about to use those. If we type in something that should return results, such as Alex, we get results. If we type in something that should return results, and one equals one. Remember, every side of an and statement has to be true for it to return results. So one does equal one, and if we hit enter, we get results. If we change that statement so that one equals two, now one side is false. Both sides have to be false for an and statement to return anything, and therefore we will not get any returns back. We start using this Boolean logic to infer information about the database. So what we're going to do is here at the injection point, we're going to put in something that's true. So Alex, single quote, and, and then we're going to start putting in our second evaluation. So we'll start with substring. We open a parenthesis for our nested select statement, and we're going to say select password from users, where username equals J Holden, limit one. Now, a lot of times, there should only be one password for one username, Jay Holden. We don't know that for sure, and substring will break if we return multiple rows. So we're just gonna put limit one to be sure. We can even do the offset zero so that we get the first one in case there is a second Jay Holden in the database. Then we say we want the first character and we only want one character. But there's nothing being evaluated in the second half of the and statement. So we need to evaluate something. We need to learn something about the password for the first J Holden user. So what we're going to say is equals a and then semicolon dash dash space. You don't strictly need that. But when we start typing this into the web app, uh, we will need it. So we might as well just keep things consistent. So when we hit enter here, we don't get any result back. And much like when we had the Alex and one equals two, we know that this second half of the Boolean statement is false, meaning that the first character of the password for J Holden is not A. Well, is it B? Is it C? And we got results back. Now these results are not Jim Holden's password. These results are Alex. We're getting the result because this half of the Boolean statement is true. So we can do this again for the next character. And we can go A, B, C, and keep doing this over and over again until you get to O, because I happen to know that his password is coffee. So we get to O and we get results back. So now we know that the first character is C, the second character is O. Can do this for the third character and we keep going through for F. Now what happens if we did a capital F? That also comes back true. Both of those can't be true. Passwords are case sensitive. In order to make queries case sensitive in SQL, we need to prefix the statement with the binary keyword. So we're going to prefix substring with binary. Now, the capital F doesn't come back correct, but the lowercase f does. So we know that in coffee, we're using a lowercase f. Now, when we're enumerating things like table names, case sensitivity doesn't matter as much because most SQL derivatives don't care about case sensitivity. But when we're pulling things like passwords and usernames and things like that, those are or can be case sensitive. So we want to know exactly what is inside the database. So it's important to understand this binary statement. 
Well, what does this look like on the web app? We did everything inside of the MySQL client, but how does that translate to the web app or to your actual attack? It's really the same thing. So we're going to start with the first single quote. We won't type that in because that's in the web app already, but we'll type in Alex, the second single quote to break out of those quotes and substring. We'll set up our nested select. So we'll select password from users where username equals J Holden limit one offset zero. Close out that nested select. We want the first character. We only want one character. Close out the substring equals a semicolon dash dash space. We're going to copy this because it's a pain to retype it over and over again and then hit enter. We get zero results. Now we can iterate through B zero results C and we get Alex again. So now we know C is the first character. Would you normally be doing it this way? Probably not. I wouldn't be typing it into the web application. I'd be using something like burp or I'd be using curl in the command line. Something like curl, use minus capital X to set our request type as post. We're going to set our form data with the minus capital F. And to get the search field that we want, we can just right click and do view page source. And we can see that we're submitting the search field here. So the name of the field is search. We're going to do some weird bash quoting. So we're going to dollar sign quotation. And then we set the search field for our form data equals Alex escape the single quote and substring set up our nested select. Another quoted single quote, J Holden quoted single quote to end that limit one offset zero kill the nested select first character one character at a time and since we already know it's C we can jump right to it all of that weird quoting by the way is just to get around the fact that bash has a hard time with various styles of quotes and semicolon so We'll close out the form data. Then we need to tell it where to send that request. In this case, the target web application is on localhost at no-union.php. And we run it and we see that we get Alex back. Now, if we were trying the second character, we would get nothing back. Second character is an O and we get Alex back. So we're just doing this manually through the command line. Some of you may be asking why you can't just use SQL map. The answer is that you can, and you absolutely should. And I'll even be making a video on SQL map for the series, but SQL maps, just a tool and tools are really only as good as the people that are operating them. It's important to understand how these things work on the SQL database themselves so that you have the information to tell SQL what to do and how to do it and why to do it. In fact, if you don't know how Boolean inference works, you can't actually do it through SQL map. You can't just point SQL map at a website and say, go do it max levels, max risk, and it'll just come back with the answer for you. You actually have to tell it what does the error or positive string look like. You need to know how this works. I've included a Python script in the lab Git repository. As it says, it is not intended to be good Python or fast Python or efficient Python. And it's not even intended to be the best way to automate this kind of a process. It's intended to be illustrative to walk you through some of the hurdles that you need to clear in order to create your own automation around this. SQL map doesn't always work for whatever reason. And sometimes it's just easier to code up your own quick and dirty automation around something. And this script can get you started doing that. If you have any questions about the script, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'm happy to respond or show up to the next live stream and I can answer any questions there.
Lastly, before we go, I want to talk about blind SQL injection. For me, blind SQL injection means that you don't get any output from the web server basically at all. A lot of times this will be when you find SQL injection in cookie fields or something like that. I haven't written any cookie-based SQL injection for this video. We're going to do that for the SQL map video, but I did code up a blind.php for this video. And it's just the same thing as the rest of the directory.php sites, except no matter what you put in, it won't return anything. So if we keep this exact scenario here and we just switch over to blind.php, we can see that it doesn't come back. In fact, if we just get rid of all of this wild SQL injection and run just Alex, which should come back with a result, it doesn't. So how can we detect SQL injection this way? Well, we generally use something out of band. So you can use DNS requests or you can use time. Time is an out of band function. So we'll add another and statement. And remember, you can tack on as many ands as you want, but each time you do it, all sides of an and statement have to be true for something to come back. So we'll add an and and we'll sleep for three seconds if it's correct. Now let's start with something that's not correct real quick so we know it'll work. If it's not correct, it won't sleep. If it is correct, we will get a sleep. And this will take several seconds to come back. It's important when you're doing timing-based SQL injection to fingerprint the site you're attacking fairly well you don't really want to ham fist it and put sleep three or sleep five or sleep 10, even though definitively you'll know for sure that your SQL injection worked, that the SQL server is processing your input as SQL. It'll take forever. When you're doing hundreds of thousands or millions of requests to fully map out an entire database, adding a five second sleep to every single positive request will take hours, days, potentially years. So a lot of times you'll end up adding like half a second to your request and you really want it as short as possible, but outside of the variance of the web server responding to you. So since it's local, we can even put a one second sleep here because it'll be obvious that it's taking some time to respond. Whereas when it's not correct, it comes back immediately. On the internet, things don't come back immediately. They usually take some latency. So you'll need to map that out yourself. SQL map will determine that for you. And we'll go into all of that functionality in that video. The next video where you're doing, however, is on fixing SQL injection, doing the actual mitigation and how you solve SQL injection. This is just as important for pen test reports and bug bounty reports as the actual exploitation itself. So it's very important to watch that video and I'll see you when that releases. Thanks for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this video, I recommend checking out the live stream from last weekend. We had some people in the chat asking questions. We went a little bit deeper into my SQL injection methodology as well as breaking down the Boolean inference a little bit more. You can also check out our CTF and War Games playlists where you can see me solving various hacking challenges real time.